Hello and welcome back to the Toolbox Project. In today's video, we're going to get those mitres sorted. Let's get going. So yeah, by the end of this episode, we are going to have all the mitres cut out, refined, and we'll have a box carcass that we can actually dry assemble. And we're going to be covering various processes in this, not only cutting the mitres, but also making a jig. And I'm going to be discussing the hand tool and machine methods of doing so. This is an absolutely crucial jig that we're going to use to pare down those mitres to give us an accurate and clean finish. And this is how it works. All we do is simply rough cut those mitres to begin with, and then we clamp this jig on the top and then use a chisel to carefully pair it back. So making this jig by machine, as you would expect, is significantly easier. All you do is stick two blocks together, rough cut this edge on it, and then clean it up with a sander or something like that to 45 degrees. If you do it by hand, however, you're probably going to want to mitre these components independently and then bring them together. And is one of the reasons I've actually bolted this together to give me a little bit of tolerance, but we'll discuss that. So to make this jig, what you're going to need to start with is two blocks like this. Nothing particularly special about these sizes. However, they are quite thick to give me plenty of surface area to rest the chisel on. And of course they are square on all four sides. Obviously don't worry about the ends at this point because we're going to be mitering those anyway. But for the sake of clarity, I'll put a drawing of this below this video on the free online woodworking school so if you're watching this on youtube just click the link in the description it'll take you to the page and you can see the dimensions of this thing so you've got something to aim for so the first thing we're going to do is put a face side and face edge on this larger component i'm going to do it in a sharpie so you can very easily see it and this face edge is going to be the bottom of the mitre jig and by the way if you're doing this by hand or machine you still want to be following this process at the moment i'll tell you when you can split off so we're next going to get one of the sides of the box and set the marking gauge up to just under the thickness of the side and by just under i mean about a millimeter shy so something like that you're then going to use that setting and on the face edge, do it on the inside of the component. Scribe a very clear line all the way up the length of it. This is going to give you a location to stick this thing on to ensure that both this edge and this edge are parallel to one another. Because there'd be no point cutting an accurate 45 degrees onto the end of this if it was just going to sit wonky on the piece anyway. Next, we're going to create a one-to-one -one ratio on a straight-edged piece of material. This is something that we covered in the Dovetail Box project in order to do a mitre, but just to run through it again. Put a mark on the straight edge, measure across a certain distance. It doesn't really matter how much, as long as you can remember it. I'm going to do 150 mil. It's about six inches. Once you've got those two marks, square the second one up into the material. And I'm doing this with a knife for extra accuracy. Then measure 150 millimeters up that line. Give yourself another mark and then simply connect that new mark with the original one you did. That's going to give you a geometrically perfect 45 degree angle and then using that line push the stock of the sliding bevel against it and angle that sliding bevel to match that line perfectly so then go back to the large block and using that 45 degree angle resting against the face edge very important that knife align at 45 degrees into the component you're going to need to do that from both sides still resting on the face edge but effectively we're just going to be cutting off all of this and all of this to give ourselves a sort of pointy thing and then cut these corners off on the bandsaw as close to that line as you dare. Of course, you could do this with a mitre saw. Just be very careful because it's quite a small component. That's why I'm going to do it on the bandsaw and I'll clean it up by hand later. And of course, if you've got a disc sander with a mitre fence, now's a great opportunity to clean back to that line using a machine. But saying that, I'm going to show you the hand tool method of doing it. And so to take it back to these lines accurately, we're going to recreate the rudimentary mitre shooting board that we made back in the dovetail box project. As a reminder, all you need for this is preferably a piece of plywood or something like that, and it needs to have a perfectly straight edge on it. I actually planed this one flat, and it's about 18 mil thick. Could be 15, could even be 12, it doesn't really matter, as long as you've got a straight edge on it. This needs to be 45 degrees or thereabouts to this edge. It'll make it easier if that's perfect 45, but it's not completely necessary. Just kind of eyeball it for now. That's a rough sawn finish at the moment. And I'm going to use the split top in my bench to clamp this down. Of course, not all of you have split tops. You'll have to find other ways of doing it, but you're looking to clamp it around this end somewhere before you do so you're going to need some sort of fence to clamp down on top of it again this needs to have a perfectly flat edge for the material to rest against and it's better if you rough cut the end at 45 degrees but it's not completely necessary you just want to position it so you've got about you know a millimeter or so poking out that way when you take the first few shavings it will flush it off and you'll have a perfectly supported back edge so i've just eyeballed this for now we're going to get this clamped down very securely but just do it on one end then 
take that 45 degree sliding bevel and use that to position the fence at a perfect 45 degrees. I personally use a mallet to tap it into position. By this point, you'd have thought I'd made a mitre shooting board, but <laughs> I just keep doing this because it's so easy. And lock that down with another couple of clamps. Really make sure this thing's secure. And before you go any further, just double check that nothing has slipped. And so now, just flush off that little bit that's sticking proud. And you can do this with any plane. It doesn't need to be a fancy one like this. You might be able to see it's just taken off the corner. And then we're going to take this block, put the face edge against the fence and plane it flush. You want to make sure you're taking a real light cut with this though, because that's quite a lot of material. As you probably saw, that was a little bit bitey then. So I've just taken the time to sharpen the blade. Let's see what that does. God, I should really promote sharpening a blade more. Look at the difference in that. End grain shavings, look. That's the good stuff. So with that side done, flip it round and do the other. And then just keep checking these with your sliding bevel as you go. In theory, it should be accurate, but you never know. Yeah, so it looks like I need to take a little bit more off the end of this one. Now that is a difficult process shooting that down. There are ways you can make it easier though. You could make it slightly thinner. You know, uh, I reckon you could probably get this down to about 12 millimeters, half an inch, and you'd be all right. Anything less than that though, you're gonna start lacking support when you're using it as a pairing block. You could also clamp it down to the shooting board while you're planing that mitre, if you're finding that it's slipping quite a lot. But above all, just make sure your plane's sharp. Okay, so with that component made, obviously just double check it, check everything is 45 degrees measuring from that face edge. And of course saying that, make sure that this edge is actually flat in the first place. And once you've got that established, we're now going to move on to the block that's going to stick on the back of it along that line that we scratched on previously. With this, we're gonna start off doing pretty much the same thing. We're gonna firstly mark a face side and a face edge. Then using that face edge, we're gonna scribe a 45 degree angle on the end using a knife, rough cut it, and then plane it back to that line using this jig. But we're just doing it on one side for now. Okay, so now we want to temporarily stick this to the back of that first component, obviously making sure to stick it along that line that we scratched on the bottom. Again, I want to emphasize that this needs to be a temporary thing because we do need to take this off to flush off the other side. I'm just using some double-sided tape for it so I can remove it later. So I've got the face side on the outside, face edge on the bottom, same on this one. I'm gonna very carefully stick it on that line while being careful to get this edge flush as well. Okay, and with that holding, flip it over and just scribe that remaining material. and then take it off. Okay, and then the next step is the same process. Rough cut it on the bandsaw and then plane back to that line very carefully. We need to hit that line bang on this time because if it's any shorter, we're gonna have to push it up further on this first component. Thus, we're not going to be able to use that line we scratched at the bottom to make it parallel. All right, and if you've done it accurately at this point, you should be able to put your component on that line and feel that both ends are flush. If something isn't lining up, just go back and double check all of your 45 degree angles and make sure they're accurate, make the tweaks as necessary. But that feels pretty good. So I'm gonna double side tape that down again and then we can start thinking about permanently fixing it in place. I'm just feeling those edges first before pushing this down, doing everything I can to make sure it feels smooth here and matches that line on the bottom. Again, it's absolutely crucial it matches this line on the bottom. Okay, so now we can start thinking about fixing these together and the obvious solution to this would be a screw. However, going into solid wood, there's a tendency, even with piloting, clearancing and countersinking, that that screw pulls this one way or another and therefore it makes it inaccurate. So that's why on this original one, I did not go for a screw. I've gone for a bolt instead. There's a couple of advantages to this, not only the one I've just mentioned, but you can also dismantle this and readdress some of these edges if they start getting chopped up a little bit. And also, if you're finding it quite difficult to get these components aligned with one another, or perhaps you bolt them together and then find that things aren't aligned, what you could do is, let's say you're using an M8 bolt like I'm using here, drill one set of those holes to eight millimeters and then the other set to 10 millimeters. And then with that second one, it will be sort of floating around the bolts. You can then move it into the correct position and lock it down there. So that's what I'm gonna do with this. I'm gonna start by drilling eight mil all the way through, see how it looks. If it looks good, happy days. If not, I'll widen one to 10 millimeters to give me a bit of wiggle room. The 
And the accuracy you need with this is you should be able to rub your hands over that end grain and not feel the step whatsoever. For me, I can feel like the tiniest thing there. And so I'm actually just pushing this component up, which is actually pushing into the threads of the bolt itself in order to make that adjustment. But that is like the tiniest bump there as well. Absolutely minuscule. Let's unlock that. Okay, so that's pretty much the jig sorted. The only thing you've got to watch out for now is if you put the chisel on that larger surface, see if you can get all the way down to the bottom without the tang interfering with the top of the jig. You can probably see on this one, that slightly tapered surface is actually causing the chisel to elevate slightly, which is why on this one that I've now taken the bolts out of, I've actually cut that top section off. You don't actually need to do this accurately or anything because nothing rests on it when you're doing it. It just needs to be taken off so that that taper on the chisel doesn't get interfered with. So let's mark that out, take it apart. And I'm gonna leave that section attached because it's got double-sided tape on it. I just wanted to make sure that it was able to sit flat on the bandsaw table rather than rest on these bolts underneath because that's pretty dangerous. So to begin with, get all the sides of the box and stand them up in the orientation they're due to be assembled. Next, on each corner, just roughly draw the direction of the mitre on it, only rough. This will prevent you from accidentally cutting the mitre the wrong direction, which is incredibly easy to do. So just simply doing this will hopefully reduce that risk significantly. And then of course, this is mitered on the top and bottom, so make sure to do the underside as well. Next, either with your sliding bevel or some alternative means of marking a 45 degree joint, we're gonna knife on the angle of those mitres. It's very important at this point that you line up this knife line with the marking gauge line on the inside of the component. Do not line it up with that outside corner. Now saying that, earlier on in the project, if you set the marking gauge to be the exact thickness of the component when scribing this line, it will meet up with that outside corner anyway. However, you may recall I said, don't overset it or don't underset it. If you have done one of those two things, this is where when you line it up with that inside corner, it won't line up with the outside. It's not really a problem. It just makes things a little bit more confusing. So I'm gonna very carefully put my knife into that intersection, slide this up to it, and then mark a line across where that mite is gonna be. Be careful when using jigs like this, by the way, because it's very easy to hit your thumb with it. I've done it quite a few times. Okay, so I've just got everything stood up again and triple checked all my marking out. And we can now start thinking about rough cutting these mitres. And I wanna quickly talk you through the difference between the mitres on the tails and the mitres on the pins. So starting with the tails, when we cut this mitre, you're gonna cut about a millimeter away from the line on the waist side, and this entire section will come off. You'll cut all the way through, and saying that, you need to be really careful not to hit the tail underneath. That's something that I do all the time, and I guarantee you I'll probably end up doing it again, but just watch out for that. As for the pin, you're gonna do exactly the same thing on the top, cut about a millimeter away from the line on the waist side, but you're only going to go as far down as the knife line scratched in the end grain. If you'll remember, this line originated from tracing around this when we were transferring the tails onto the pins. So it's very important not to cut off that entire section. And so for that reason, I choose to begin with the pins first. And to start with, what we're gonna do is cut along the top and cut down the back like this with our saw at 45 degrees. Again, it's really important you don't go in perpendicular here because we don't want to cut a line down the front side of the component. Before sawing anything, however, what I'd recommend you do is take that line on the top and square it down the inside of the component. This will make it easier to chisel back to later because as you'll probably see now, we won't be able to cut directly to this line like we did with the pins because that groove is in quite an annoying position to do so. So now with the saw at 45 degrees, see if I can cut about half a millimeter away from the line. Oh yeah, I've just about got enough material, but you can see if the groove was any closer than that, the saw's gonna start slipping into it and things like that. And so if that happens with you, just start with the saw in the groove and continue from there. And keep an eye on both lines. You don't wanna go below the marking gauge and you don't wanna go beyond that back corner. So I'm gonna carry on and get all of these diagonal cuts done on both pin components on both ends. After that, we'll move on to actually cutting the mitre off. Uh, 
Okay, now let's start trimming these mitres off. So again, cut as close to the line as you dare, but don't worry about cutting on it because we'll chisel back to it using the paring block afterwards. I'm going for about half a millimetre away. And there you go, so hopefully you can see the line on the end grain at the bottom and also the one on the mitre at the top, both to be chiseled back to later. Okay, and then the tails next. So this is a little bit simpler, but just be very careful for when that saw drops after cutting off this pin that you don't hit that tail. Watch me do it now. Very carefully. There we go. Oh, I still tapped it, look. One very minor casualty there. Very minor though, that, that'll easily be fixable, but Oh, it wouldn't be mitre dovetails without me doing that. Right, so now's the scary bit. Let's start pairing back to those lines using the jig. So I didn't mention this earlier, but the reason we scribe that internal line on this jig to be slightly thinner than the thickness of the material is so that we can clamp this anywhere on the bench without the bottom of this interfering with it. In the past, I've accidentally made these too long and I've had to put it close to the edge of the bench. Therefore, the outside of this mitre isn't properly supported. Whereas like this, I can put it right in the middle of the bench and be sure that that mitre has got plenty of support. And so the end goal with this mitre is to pair it back until you hit that marking gauge line in the bottom of the mitre. But depending how close you've cut with the saw, you probably don't want to take that all off in one chop. It's standard practice here. When cutting away joints, you want to take off as much as possible before committing to the final line. So I'm going to get a clamp on this first, very loosely. Position this to just take a little skim off that mitre. Check that I've got clearance for the chisel above the clamp. So the handle of the chisel is actually hitting the clamp there and therefore it's causing it to elevate. It's little things like that that you unfortunately learn the hard way with joints like this. So there you go, that's all fine now. Chisel has got plenty of clearance. And I've done this various ways in the past. The way I taught in a previous video was to just simply use a block above and then go down like that. However, there is a tendency for the chisel to start diving into the material. So I've recently started experimenting with a jig like this again, and I've come to really love it. So what we'll do is rest the chisel on this side section and just take a very small skim off the side and basically start working your way in. I've got loads of pressure from above on the chisel at the moment, being sure to keep it engaged in that cut. There we go. So that's the first skim done. Let's move it back a little bit more. I'm actually really close to this line. I think I can put that straight into it now. So just double check that. Slide your chisel down. You should see it drop into the marking gauge line, which it has. Again, check your clearance on your chisel. And then with loads of pressure from above, start working your way in. Okay, so I can actually see a little bit of the marking gauge line there on the bottom. So I actually need to go back just a smidge further. I think my chisel was locked into the wall of the marking gauge line rather than the base of it. That's definitely there now. Right, eh, better that than taking off too much, eh? There we go. Looks pretty good. And so that is what we're aiming for at the end. You might see the tiniest remnants of the marking gauge line at the bottom. And that's okay because that's actually where we've split the marking gauge line in half. It's that precise. And hopefully if you mark your 45 degrees accurately, there should be no marking up the side there. Now in theory, because the jig does most of the work, you don't actually need to knife it up the side. However, I choose to do so just to prevent the wood accidentally splintering or something outside of that mitre. By knifing the grain first, you essentially sever it and therefore the splits can't go any further than what you've already cut. And so that's a really good way of getting a nice clean mitre. As for the pins, this is exactly the same process. Don't worry about cleaning back to this line just yet. We'll do that after we've paired all the mitres. Check your clearance on your chisel. And when you're doing this, just angle it slightly to start cutting into that wall on the inside, just ever so slightly. This will make it easier to peel away this material afterwards. Okay, so finally, we've got to get back to this line on the end grain. So to begin with, get your knife and sever the fibers along the wall of the pin. You would have already somewhat done this with the chisel, but it's good to just double check you have done so with this, especially making sure you've done the bottom part of the wall where it intersects the marking gauge line. Get your chisel, put that in the knife line that's scribed up the back of the pin and carefully wiggle it up and down 
while then tilting it forward to track the line on top. You don't want to force it, just go nice and steady. And eventually, as you saw then, it will just pop off. And the reason it did that is because we severed the fibers at the bottom. If it doesn't, you might want to come across and just make it slightly deeper with the knife or even go in with your chisel and just carefully clean a few bits up. So I've still got a few bits in the corner. Let's clean them up. And there's your mitered pin finished. Okay, so the moment of truth is upon us. Now I have gone through and double checked each and every one of these sockets to ensure that the walls are traveling down vertical. I've checked every single baseline to ensure that they are either flat or slightly undercut with the exception of this larger one that needs to be perfectly flat and square across its thickness. I've also gone over all the mitres to ensure that the mitre starts at exactly on that baseline, no more, no less. And because I set the marking gauge to the exact thickness of these components, I've also checked the ends of them to ensure that comes to a complete point that is flush with the top of the pin. If when you cut these mitres, you set the marking gauge over the thickness or under the thickness of these sides, then that mitre will not end on the corner. So you can't use that end to gauge how accurate you've been with the mitres. However, you can still use that internal marking gauge line, which is why we used it in the first place. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna give this a dry assemble, see how it looks. Yeah, this bit's unscripted. I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> So unlike the previous projects we've done on this free online woodworking school, we don't actually want these to be too tight. There's a lot of dovetails here. And so if they require a lot of whacking to bottom out, then we're gonna have problems when the glue is applied. So that, okay, that's just about going in by hand. That's good. Yeah, okay, we might be able to just finish that off with a mallet. Oh, see, that's the fit we're going for just a press fit in like that, but still grabs really nicely. That is what we're going for. This is slightly too tight, but we can work with that. Let's see how it goes together. Finally, number three. Oh, again, that's looking pretty hopeful. And four, yeah, those are pressing in. Oh, a bit tight there. No, actually I lie. No, that is going in by hand. Just flip it over to see what this side's like. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna do a little bit of easing on this one. You know, it's going in fine. But with glue applied, that's going to be, it's going to be significantly stiffer. Not bad though. Not bad. Let's do the rest of them. Oh, that one's already gone in automatically. That's good. Cool. Yeah, those are both fine. So it is actually just that one corner that I need to address. So I've taken note of that number two. We'll go back to that in a minute. But let's have a look, shall we? So yeah, really happy with how that's gone together. That is very good. So we'll see, we're gonna quickly address that one corner, but it's worth saying now, if yours didn't go together quite as smoothly as that and you're identifying areas where you still need to take off material, don't just hack away at it without guidance. I've got a video that was part of the dovetail box project I did previously that will show you how to adjust dovetail pins accurately. So that'll be linked below should you wish to get a bit of guidance for it. So let's disassemble this and start adjusting that remaining side. Firstly, to disassemble a box like this, don't just start trying to rip it apart. That is gonna result in you twisting one of the top boards and possibly snapping the pins or something like that. Get a small mallet, and you can put a protective block inside if you want, but I've got a slightly domed face on this mallet so it doesn't bruise it at all. And we're gonna start hitting on the inside of this while ever so slightly lifting this up off the surface below. Literally a couple of millimeters. Don't have it up like this, just a couple of millimeters and then tap it all the way along. So we've got that one about five millimeters out, spin it round, do the same the other side, and just work them out evenly like that. 
Right, so we've got number two up in the vise, and what I'm looking for is areas within these walls that look significantly shinier than the rest. And you might be able to see them already. There's kind of a patch at the top of this pin. There's a patch there. And there is, of course, more on the other sides that you can't see at the moment. These are burnished areas that the tails have been rubbing against and have actually compressed those fibers flat. So we want to take a sharp chisel coming from the front and just very carefully peel those away. Be careful not to dig in here. All you're doing is removing enough material to get rid of that burnishing. Also, don't forget to check the pin that meets the mitre on the ends. These ones are notorious for overlooking and thus causing a joint that's too tight. The other thing we'll also do is on the back of these tails, we'll put a very small chamfer to aid with assembly. In theory, this also helps spread the glue within the joint as well. I'm not sure how backed up that is, but hey, there's no harm in it. And so all we're going to do with this is start the chisel about five millimeters back from the end. Don't start it on the end or else you'll get a nice triangular shaped gap. So about five millimeters in and just peel away the back corner of the tail. You only need to take off a tiny amount here, not too much, and then separate it from the shoulder. And to be honest, I'll do this on all four sets of the tails. There's no harm in it. Let's have a gander, shall we? See if this made it any better. Oh, great, I chamfered the wrong ones. <laughs> well, it's a good job I was gonna do them all anyway, isn't it? Looking good. Okay, so we're gonna call this step a success, but before you click off this video, please, please take note of the following. When you're test fitting this box, feel free to try fitting the lid in it and assemble the box around it. Feel free to do exactly the same with the base, but, but do not do it with the top and the base fitted at the same time while dry fitting this thing. You can do it when you've got the actual glue on it, but if you do it while you're dry fitting, you won't be able to take it apart. There's no areas on this that you can get leverage or get a hammer in to take it apart. It is just gonna be one solid block that you cannot get access to to disassemble. I've seen it happen and it's not pretty the methods you have to use in order to separate it. In short, basically it involves jamming things into the sockets and wiggling it apart like that, thus bruising your baselines and things like that. So yeah, test them independently, do not test them together. Unfortunately, having both the lid and the base fitted at the same time is just something we've got to go for when we do the actual glue up. So as always, Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do not forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to make the most of the supporting resources below. I'll see you in the next video.